Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Lindsay Brander. I am the Assistant Superintendent at Elkhart Community Schools and also the Indiana CEC Secretary. Welcome to Breaking Down Barriers Fall Symposium presented by the Indiana Council for Exceptional Children. Thank you for joining us today. This session will be recorded to share out after the conclusion of the symposium. We are hopeful that you're going to walk away with valuable information that will help you in your role supporting staff, students, and the entire school community. Before we begin, I just want to make you aware that questions should be entered in the Q&A. Marcy has a relatively interactive uh, presentation today, so please use the Q&A to respond. At the end of this session, we'll allow the presenter to answer as many questions as time will permit. Sessions will be recorded and will be shared after the symposium has ended. Keep an eye out for an email from the Indiana Council for Exceptional Children. At the end of today's symposium, you'll be asked to complete an exit ticket. We invite you to provide feedback, which is a valuable gift to us. This is also how you earn your PGP points. Now, I am very pleased to introduce the always amazing Dr. Marcy Wilburn. Marcy Wilburn has worked in the field of special education for 17 years. For six years, she taught both general and special education across settings while earning a master's, in, uh, master's of Arts in Applied Behavior Analysis from Ball State University. In 2012, she began working as the coordinator for programming achieve. I'm sorry, for the promoting for the promoting achievement for students with sensory loss pass project at Indiana State University, providing professional learning to educators working with sensory loss. Currently, she is the associate director for the IEPTA Center, conducting training and supporting districts across the state to promote inclusive practices and improve student outcomes. In addition, Marcy recently completed her doctorate in curriculum and instruction from Indiana State University. Thank you, Dr. Wilbur. Thank you, Lindsay. I appreciate it. And congrats on assistant superintendent. That is news to me. So congratulations are warranted there. Um, we are going to talk about high leverage practices today. Um, we just did a session on the first three high leverage practices all around collaboration. And the last um, 11 high leverage practices are all around instruction. And we are going to talk specifically about um, the high leverage practices on systematically designing instruction or specially designed instruction. Um, so as we know, that's what's special about special education. And we will conclude today with some conversations on accommodations and modifications if we have time. Um, but the focus of our work today will really be on that specially designed instruction. Um, so for those of you who weren't in my previous session, if you're not familiar with the IEPTA Center, I just wanted you to know a little bit about our center. Um, so we have the luxury of heading around the state to work with educators to improve outcomes for students with disabilities. And the way that we do that is we really increase the skill set of our teachers. So we want our teachers to build their knowledge and capacity to support a diverse group of students, making sure that all students have equitable access to that tier one curriculum and that we're supporting our students throughout when it's needed. Um, we offer free training across the state. Um, so if you're interested, you can go to our website, iepta.org, and you are able to find out additional resources and or um, trainings that are available in your area. So please feel free to do that. Um, those of you who are in my last session, you can just say, I'm back. That's fine. If you are new to this session, I'm going to give you some of the information about myself that maybe Lindsay did not. Um, and you just go ahead and tell me who's here today um, and tell me a little bit more about you. So um, I have two kiddos, twin boys. They're in second grade. And um, my husband's also an educator in the Mooresville Community Schools. He's an instructional design coach. So he helps teachers utilize technology within their classrooms. Um, I am a sycamore through and through, did my undergrad and my doctoral work at ISU, but I am also um, a cardinal at Ball State, chirp, chirp to anybody who can relate to that. Um, I love beaches, Diet Coke, and all things chocolate. So if that is you, let me know. Um, Lindsay, just so you know, I do not have access to the Q&A this time, so you might have to let me know what's happening within the Q&A. Okay, I, I actually do not see the Q&A down here, so let me see if I can work on that. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and if you are a participant and able to comment in the chat, please go ahead and do so. Um, with webinars, sometimes it just allows you to comment within the Q&A, but happy to address the Q&A or the chat, um, so let me know. 
Lindsay, I think you just sent that to me and you. So send it to everyone and then we'll have that. Ah, thank you. Okay. You're I'm testing it out. I uh, am not an excellent uh, moderator apparently. All right. Can everyone see oh, this God. and just pop a yes in if you can see it. And if you can reply in there, that would be great. Yes. We can, then we can use the chat function. The first learning objective of today is to figure out Q&A or chat function if we have access to either one of those. Um, but we have three other learning objectives for today. So we want to make sure that we're defining and providing examples, especially design instruction. Um, make sure that you have examples of accommodations and modifications. And then really look at considerations for planning SDI and when to provide accommodations and when to provide a com a modifications. So that really encompasses our three learning objectives of today. Um, we do have stuff available for you. Um, so I had two sessions at this training today. So what I did was I went ahead and made one Padlet for both trainings so that you have access. Obviously, both of my sessions are focused on high level practices. Um, so I wanted to make sure that you had those resources. And then I have some additional resources for this session all around evidence-based practices and specially designed instruction. So you can access the Padlet in two ways. You can either take your phone and scan the QR code by opening your camera, um, and that'll take you to the information on your phone. Or if you prefer to use your laptop or even your phone um, in the browser, you can enter padlet.com slash IEPTA slash INCEC. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and enter that into the chat now so that you can open that with me. Marcy, I have opened up the chat, so everyone should be able to type in the chat. Oh, thank you. Perfect. All right, that Padlet's available for you, so you can click on that link, or you can go ahead and scan the QR code as well. I am going to pop out of my PowerPoint really quickly just to show you what's available for you in Padlet. So the first thing that we have in Padlet is the column on high leverage practices. So high leverage practices um, are came about through the Council for Exceptional Children and the Cedar Center out of Florida. And basically what they wanted, they wanted to identify practices that teachers needed to implement frequently within their practice in order to improve outcomes for students with disabilities. Um, and so they've dedicated um, all of this space and resource and effort around these high leverage practices. So you can go to highleveragepractices.org and there are ample resources for you. Um, some of my faves for pre-service teachers or early educators might be the videos of other teachers explicitly showing you what these high leverage practices look like in practice. So those are available. Um, other things that we have lead teachers on here or directors on here, um, they do have PowerPoint slides available ready for PD um, or professional development for your teachers that you can pull off, customize, make your own, and then provide that information to your teachers as well. So highleveragepractices.org, um, lots of information that you can access on the high leverage practices. The other thing that I find helpful is a self-assessment tool. So if you just want to see what are your areas of strength, in regard to these high leverage practices, what are your opportunities for growth? You could complete this on your own and just see where you fall. Um, it is a pretty expansive website. So I like to provide this walking tour that kind of takes you through each section of the website to see what might be most beneficial to you. And last but not least, um, we have the high leverage practice laminated guides. Um, in my last session, I forgot and gave these out at the very end to people. Um, one person will get the guides today for high leverage practices. The other person will get uh, Ann Benninghoff's book, Specially Designed Instruction, which I think is a pretty easy read. It's not like a big fat textbook, um, but definitely something that could be beneficial. So if I forget, Lindsay, at the end of today's session, remind me to, to ask for a couple numbers so I can find some individuals to win these prizes today. Got it. Um, the slide deck for collaboration that I just did is on here and available. Even if you didn't attend that session, that's yours to look at if you um, would like to. There is also a column on instruction. And this is what has our SDI slide deck available to you. And then some other areas where you can find some evidence-based practices around instruction and where to go with some of your learners who are maybe having difficulty either gaining academic or social competencies within the classroom. 
And last but not least, I have a column on IEPTA Center where you can access our website and find some of those free trainings that I spoke of earlier. So again, this Padlet's available to you. It will be available to you. It doesn't come down after this session. Um, if somebody reaches out and says, oh, can you add this? Um, I'm happy to put that information on here and it'll be available for everyone after the fact as well. Um, so um, utilize this as needed. But as we kick off on specially designed instruction today, what I would like for you to do, utilize the chat and go ahead and tell me what you know. So in what year was SDI or specially designed instruction required by law for students eligible to receive special education students? Was it in 1975 with the Education for All Handicapped Children Act? Was it in 1990 with IDEA? Or was it in 2004 with the reauthorization of IDEA? So go ahead and we'll do this waterfall fall style. It looks like some people are already chatting in, which is great. Um, if, yep, we will just do it any style because they're already in here. Okay, so I see, Nineteen ninety, we have some lots of C's, so lots of two thousand fours. We have another nineteen ninety. B C. Okay, so we have mostly B's and C's in the chat. I would say. All right, let's see if you are right. Actually, if you pull up Public Law ninety four one forty two, from nineteen seventy five. Here is what you can find in the legislation. The term special education means specially designed instruction at no cost to parents or guardians to meet the unique needs of a handicapped child, including classroom instruction, instruction in PE, home instruction, and instruction in hospitals and institutions. So specially designed instruction is not something that is new. It has been around since 1975. Rebecca, I love your honesty. I Googled it because I didn't remember. Hey, no problem at all. But had you asked me, and I, I didn't do this research, I probably would have thought, yeah, later, like 2004, the reauthorization, or even in the 90s. But no, specially designed instruction is truly what special education means and why it's so important that students who are eligible to receive services are receiving specially designed instruction within their curriculum, within their classrooms, with their special ed teachers, with their gen ed teachers. Um, so we need to make sure that that is in place for students or we are not meeting the letter of the law. We are not meeting their IEP if specially designed instruction is not in place. That's why it's so important that we have information about it. All right, so. Within the definition of SDI, and the, the definition has changed, obviously it's not gonna say handicapped children anymore, right? Like it's been updated in those reauthorizations. But as we're looking here, I'm gonna show you the new F definition. And there are three what's and three why's within the definition of SDI. Before I even show you the definition, and these are guesses, educated guesses, do you have any guesses on what the three what's might be or the three why's might be? And if you just have one, just type in one thing and we'll we'll see if you get it right. Okay, a Y might be equitable access. Okay. What does the student need? Might be that what component. Address individual needs. Nice. We have some background knowledge here for sure. The what is instruction geared towards a learning style. For every identified student, what is what the teacher is utilizing? What strategies are most effective? Nice. Okay, now I'm gonna give you the definition and some of you are gonna be validated and some of you might wanna change your responses, which is fine too. So I just pulled this straight out of article seven. So as we're looking here, any ideas on the three what's or the three why's? Or you can say, yep, I was right. Or 
nope, I want to change my answer. And that's okay too. That's why we're here. All right, no brave souls want to share the what or the why for me after looking at the definition. Some people who said access, definitely a why. Access to the general education curriculum right there for you. Somebody said for all students, which it's not exactly stated this way, right? But it says to address the unique needs of the child. So whatever the unique needs of that specific child are. The what, how the teacher delivers that instruction, right? Absolutely, Allison. So as we're looking here, the what is in blue. So exactly what Allison said, delivery of instruction. But the other two components of the what are content and methodology. So content, methodology, and delivery are my what's. My why's are in orange. Address the unique needs, which you guys had. Ensure access, which you guys had and meet the educational standards. Now, as we're looking at this last one, I think it's interesting that it is written this way and something that we as special educators probably need reminders of. We want to ensure access to the general curriculum so that the child can meet the educational standards within the jurisdiction of the public agency that apply to all children. That's why we have our goals based on grade level standards. And it doesn't mean that every student is meeting that grade level standard. If they were able to do that, we wouldn't need to support it. If they were able to do that right now, right away. But our job is to scaffold that support up to that grade level standard. And we need an awareness of what that standard is because it says the standard that applies to all children. So we need to make sure that the end goal is always going to be there. Now, we're not making it there yet, but we're scaffolding up to get to that point. And that's what's so important. And the way that we're going to scaffold up is through the content methodology and delivery of our instruction or especially design instruction that we're going to dive into a little bit more today. So as we look at content, this is the what. And I think many of you had this. What are the students learning? So as I said, students with disabilities are expected to master the same standards as classmates without disabilities. That's the end all be all goal. We have to get there and we need to recognize that the path that students take to get to those goals may look very different than that of their peers. And so standards can be taught using different content. You might change the what for a child. That's part of specially designed instruction, the teacher changing the what. You might change the methodology or the how. So this is what that teacher is responsible for, right? You might change the instruction or how you're conveying that information to the student with different strategies, different interventions, different techniques. And the more ways that we can provide different methodologies to students, the more effective and efficient students can be. If we have different ways that meet the specific needs of that child. Remember, going back to those barriers that are in place because of the disability, if we have methodologies that are tailored to that specific student, then we are able to effectively and efficiently teach that child. So the methodology might have to change. So content and methodology, and last one being delivery of instruction. So the when and where the students are taught. The instructional context may change. The place where they're at may change. Maybe they're in the general education classroom. And if they are, they still are required to receive specially designed instruction. They might be in a separate setting receiving those types of service, like a special education classroom, OTPT office, a counselor's office. They might be working with a speech language psychologist. But the instructional context might differ for students. Group size might differ. 
the dosage, how often we're providing that service to them. Are we giving opportunities to pre-teach to get an extra time? Or maybe we're being more reactive and reteaching after the fact and giving them additional. But we know that when we change content, methodology and delivery of instruction, whether we change two out of the three, one out of the three, or all three at the same time, that is specially designed instruction. That is the what. That is what we want to see teachers doing to provide specially designed instruction. What is SDI not? It's not differentiation. Differentiation is a best practice, and we want to make sure that we're meeting students where they're at. We're looking at learning preferences. We're helping students determine how they learn best. We're making expert learners with universal design for learning, but just imploring those two frameworks does not imply specially designed instruction is taking place. So that's a part of that tier one instruction. That is great. We need to make sure we're also looking at those three components we talked about earlier, content, methodology, and instructional delivery. Um, homework help, though great. That's not specially designed instruction. That's not looking at the barriers that are in place and instructing specifically on that. Now, if we have an executive function issue with a student and a student is unable to turn that homework in and we're teaching a process so that the student now knows what to do with the homework and who to turn it into, that instruction of the process could be considered specially designed instruction because the teacher is doing something to teach um, towards their skill of executive function deficit. So. Remember, specially designed instruction is what the teacher is doing to provide that instruction. Um, it's not just content support, it's beyond that. We have to teach it differently. Um, and it's not just providing accommodation and modifications. Oftentimes these things are in addition to specially designed instruction. These things are provided as well, but just because I'm doing these things does not mean that specially designed instruction is taking place. So who can provide specially designed instruction? It is really a shared responsibility. Special educators can't do it all. They are not in that general education classroom 100% of the time to always be providing that. So they need to work alongside their general education counterparts and help them learn, this is what it looks like for this student. This is how this student is going to learn best and give them the knowledge and skills in order to implement that specially designed instruction within the classroom. And we know, that if we're doing it for a student with a disability, it could also benefit other students who might be at-risk learners or struggling to, to gain a concept. Um, however, it's legally mandated for the student with a disability and we can utilize that for other students as well. So shared responsibility by these licensed educators. Um, paraprofessionals can absolutely provide specially designed instruction but under the direction of the special education teacher or the general education teacher. Um, so we are letting them know this is what needs to be done in order for this student to be successful. This is the instruction that is needed for this student to be successful. So specially designed instruction must be research-based and data-driven. Um, we need to make sure that there's evidence-based around the instruction that we're providing based on the individual student's needs. So going back to the definition within Article 7, the individual needs. So research-based needs to look at maybe disability, maybe age of the student, setting of the student, specific content areas, or even down to specific skill levels within content areas. Um, so for example, if we have a um, evidence-based practice that we want to utilize with a kindergarten student. And we go look at the evidence base behind it. And what we find is that it's only been tested with middle school students. Then that's probably not the best strategy to utilize with a kindergarten student. So we need to see, is there evidence related to, you know, five and six-year-olds as opposed to 12 and 13-year-olds? Um, if we have an evidence-based strategy, that is specific to success for students on the autism spectrum, is that the same strategy that we're gonna use for a student with a learning disability? And maybe, yes, as long as there's research supporting both, but we need to look at the individual needs of the student, and then we can look at the evidence base behind it. So the evidence needs to be aligned with the needs of that student. So 
different areas that you might look in fall under those considerations when we're looking at the evidence base behind the practices that we're choosing. So when we talk about possible domains or areas of work for SDI, they are as different as the students that we serve. So we have students who struggle with reading. We have students who struggle with math. And absolutely, we are going to support those students and provide additional instruction in those areas. But we have students who struggle in many other domains beyond academics. Um, we talked a little bit about executive function earlier. What's that organizational piece look like? What's that behavioral piece look like? Um, going down to the bottom, what does the technology look like for the student? Maybe specially designed instruction, it's not necessarily handing the student an iPad. Giving them that is giving them a tool that they need, but I need instruction on how to utilize that tool. That is the specially designed instruction. And what we find is oftentimes when we teach to a tool, students end up flying way beyond where we ever taught them, but we have to teach it first. That instructional piece on technology is specially designed instruction. Just handing them a device is not specially designed instruction. So any of those these domains that are listed here and beyond, um, when you're looking at students' opportunities for growth and what they might need additional instruction and support on, could be something that we're providing specially designed instruction on that topic or on that area in order to promote growth and progress towards those goals. So how do I know it's specially designed instruction? The IEPTA Center actually offers a checklist where you can go in and look at kind of um, that SDI box within your IEP and see, am I doing these things? Is this aligned? Um, so looking at present levels of performance, the SDI is aligned with those present levels. Um, the SDI is specifically addressing goals within the IEP. It's researched or evidence-based like we talked before. Um, really looking at the individual needs of the student. It's teacher-led. So again, this is what the teacher is doing to provide the instruction for the student um, in a very systematic way. So go back to explicit instruction with Anita Archer. I do, you do, we do. That's what that instruction is going to look like. And when we systematically design it, we are putting supports in place. Here's what our end goal looks like. Here's how we're going to get to that end goal. Here are some benchmarks or measurements we might take as we're working towards that to see if we're meeting our um, goal overall. But we are utilizing the initial baseline data to make decisions on that instruction. Oftentimes, that's our present levels. We're going to deliver it over time, and we're going to document the delivery of that instruction. So you know as well as I do, if we don't document it in special education, then it didn't happen. So we need to make sure we know when the specially designed instruction is um, being provided to that student. And then similar to progress monitoring data, we're gonna evaluate based on data over time. If it's not working, we're gonna go back and we're gonna change the specially designed instruction that we're providing. Or sometimes what we find is we're not providing that specially designed instruction with fidelity. So we need to go back and ensure, if we said we were gonna provide specially designed instruction on whatever this need was, and we were gonna do it 30 minutes a day, but the student was absent half the time, or maybe the student came late to school and missed that intervention, or maybe you got pulled for a case conference and weren't able to provide that in information. If that's taking place, then we need to go and put the intervention in place with fidelity before we start looking at data for that. Um, so there's decisions that need to be made around the data. And we can't wait until progress reports are due to collect that data point. We wanna see trend lines over time and what does that data look and how does that inform our instruction as we go. Um, again, this is instruction that's needed by the student with a disability. If they don't need specially designed instruction, we need to go back and look that are they eligible to receive services? Remember, special education is specially designed instruction. So we wanna be making sure that um, if a student is eligible to receive services, they are receiving specially designed instruction that is aligned with the goals that they are working toward. Um, we're really looking at the deficits that students have in order um, that are a barrier or hindering them from reaching those grade level standards and how do we support them um, and master some of those skills so that they can make progress towards those standards. 
And as always with special education, um, we need to look at skill transfer and maintenance. What's that generalization of skills look like for students? How are we making sure that they can um, utilize the newly learned skills across settings and not just where they were taught? So how do we build that in to our instruction over time so that students can generalize and skill transfer? So we have examples of SDI here, and oftentimes immediately people go to packages or comprehensive programs. And that is definitely an example of research-based, specially designed instruction. So we have systematic phonics types instructions like Wilson Reading or Gillingham, um, additional reading supports with Read 180. We have Touch Math. All of those are you know, research-based programs that can be bought and utilized. Um, or specially designed instruction. Do you have to have those things? Absolutely not. You do not have to have programs in place to provide SDI. Are they helpful? They can be. But again, if Wilson says you need to be utilizing this program so many minutes per day, then you have to um, continue to implement with fidelity or the research base behind that is not going to um, be effective. So things to consider when you have packages or programs, make sure they are done as they were intended to be done. Um, other things that we can do, so providing that macro level, level SDI, what are the integrated practices that we know are effective for students with disabilities? And this takes us back to some other high leverage practices within that um, instructional domain that we're, we're talking about now, but there's a high leverage practice specific to direct explicit instruction. So how are we ensuring that's the kind of instruction that our students with disabilities are receiving um, throughout their curriculum? Making sure that we're modeling information, if that's helpful for students, that's one example. Um, chaining, backward chaining, forward chaining. Um, how are we building those tasks up to what they need to be done? And then the task analysis piece, maybe I can't master all of it, but I can do a chunk of it. How do I break that down for students? So all of those things are integrated practices that are specially designed instruction. We just have to make sure that they're implemented over time and that we're documenting those implementations throughout. Um, instructional techniques or strategies for specially designed instruction. Um, think about learning strategies that you're teaching potentially to all students that we know are research-based and evidence-based for students with disabilities. Acronym-based learning, think mnemonics, differential reinforcement. So just examples, not the end-all be-all. Um, Multi-sensory instruction. So how are we um, implementing visual, auditory, kinesthetic, tactile learning um, that's available? So those instructional techniques are specially designed instruction when they're aligned with present levels and they are making progress towards a learning goal. Um, and then lastly, um, increasing that instructional um, intensity can also be specially designed instruction. So repetition, sometimes it takes students 400 times instead of 200 times of hearing it in order to grasp it. So how are we providing the opportunities for that to take place? And not only the opportunities, but what does the practice look like? And what does the skill look like that we're working towards? And how are we breaking that down so that um, we're looking at the content methodology and instructional practices when we're increasing the intensity of that instruction that's taking place. So all of these can be examples of SDI. Um, there's not necessarily one that's better than the other. It's highly dependent upon where the student's at and how are we basing what we're providing on the individual needs of that child. So when we talk about planning for SDI, um, SDI is intended to address those IEP goals that we have. It's needed for the instruction. It's tailored for the students and adjusted as needed. So again, we're looking at that data to see if it's working or not, and it's helping students reach their goals. Um, and then I think this part is important as well. Special educators should also understand the characteristics of their students that will shape all of the instruction. So here's what we're gonna do during this time when we're providing the specially designed instruction. Here are other barriers that might be in place. Um, to the education that we need to support over time, maybe in the general education environment or other environments, and what does that look like? So I think this is helpful. So this comes from Ann Benninghoff's book, Specially Designed Instruction. Um, like I said, one winner will walk away with that today. Um, I'll mail that to you, but I think it's helpful to take SDI that, you know, you can look at all three areas, content, methodology, and instructional delivery, 
but it really helps you kind of determine what instruction might be best for the students that you're serving. So the first one is we always have to know what the learning target is. What do we want the student to be able to do? And if we go back to the learning target, oftentimes that's where we can look at different content to serve its purpose. So if we want students, for example, to be able to answer WH questions throughout a text, um, do we need to adjust the level of that text in order for them to get practice, more practice with the skill? That might be something that we need to do. If we want students to write a five paragraph essay, do we teach to a graphic organizer and teach them how to use, utilize that in order for them to organize their writing? But if I'm learning about the Civil War, do I have to necessarily write in order to do that? So clarifying that learning target really helps us know as teachers and educators what instruction we need to hone in on because we know what we want the student to be able to do at the end of the lesson. Um, pinpoint difficult moments. So you know your student, you know maybe what students in the past have struggled with and what might be difficult for this student based on those past experiences or even past experience of the student of challenges that they've had academically. So go ahead and pre-plan for those difficult moments. Align that instruction. We already had the learning target. Now we have goals within the IEP. We're gonna also look at are there goals that we can address within this instruction at the same time. Um, really think about the metacognitive processes that take place for students in their learning. So really, what does this look like when a student is successful and how might they think about this process um, if it's a student who is able to do it correctly. And that process, if that's something we can make tangible for our students, we can teach to the process. So something to consider there. Um, really looking at what's the general approach that the, you know, the general education teacher might be taking um, and what can we do differently around that. So this gives you some of those ideas that we talked about on types of SDI. So are we pre-teaching? Are we providing visuals? Um, is it more small group instruction? Are we chunking it differently? Um, will one of these methods potentially work better for the student with whom I'm serving? Um, looking at access skills. So are there different things that the, the behaviors that the student needs to learn in order to access the content? And do we start there as opposed to jumping right into the content? That could be something that we need to start that specially designed instruction with. And then if you have students who, who maybe just are not engaged or not interested in learning, what can I do to boost that participation? Because we know, based on Hattie's work, opportunities to respond has a high effect size. So if students are engaged and able to respond to content, then they're going to be more successful. So how do we embed that within our specially designed instruction that we're providing to students? So again, just some questions when you are planning your SDI that can can kind of guide you in what you're doing. Um, SDI is a balance between the standards to which all students are held and the unique learning needs of the students with disabilities. So you have to keep the standards in mind. You have to keep the learning needs of your students um, in mind as well. And then where do those fall together? Where can you combine that? Um, and I, I love this quote. It's at the heart of what makes special education special and unique. And as special educators, it is our job to make sure it's camp carefully planned, implemented with fidelity, and assessed to determine its impact on the student's outcomes. And those are all part of our jobs. It just becomes pretty complex when we're working with multiple students who have various needs. Um, so finally, we're gonna um, talk about accommodations and modifications today and how these are different than instruction. So when we talk about instruction, remember, it is what the teacher is doing. And we're either going to change the content methodology and or instructional delivery of the work. Um, just giving accommodations or modifying the work is not that instructional piece. So these are supported alongside the specially designed instruction to help our students be most beneficial. Um, so really, when we're talking about accommodations, we're talking about how the child learns or accesses the curriculum. So the only thing that we're changing is the way in which they have access. Whereas when we talk about modifications, we are talking about what the child is taught. You always have to go back to those learning targets. If the learning targets are aligned with the standards at the grade level 
and we are providing accommodations in order for the student to access that. So we might be providing auditory text. That's accommodation. The text is still at grade level. Um, there are variations to that, and we'll, we'll get to that in some examples in a little bit. Um, when we talk about modifications, we are taking that learning standard and we're knocking it down so that the learning target changes for the student. So rather than working on third grade level mathematics, we're taking them down to first grade mathematics in order to do that. That is more of a modification. We're changing the complexity of the level of instruction in which students are receiving. But accommodations, allowing use of a graphic organizer, allowing use of a calculator, all of those things are leveling that playing field and I'm not changing the content that I'm teaching to students. So let's just do a little, let's check time, show what you know activity. So this is where I'm gonna stop talking and let you kind of talk a little bit. I will read the first one and you are going to put A or M in the chat. Now, so that we don't have the, oh, I saw everybody else had this. Um, what I want you to do is go ahead and after I read it, put your A or M in, but don't hit enter until I say waterfall. When I say waterfall, everybody's going to enter at the, the same time, and then all of your A or M's will flood the chat box. Um, and then I will tell you, some can be justified one way or the other, and there might be a better response, um, but you could say, this is why I selected what I did, um, and you can explain that within the chat as well um, once we get to that discussion piece. So let's look at number one. A ninth grade student is provided a calendar to break down a large project into smaller parts and is provided extended time, time and a half to complete this assignment. So put your A or M in and waterfall. Okay, so I see mostly A's, but I did see some M's go across. Okay, so. If you had A, I would have picked A for this one because you are taking a large project that is a ninth grade project that all students are doing. The two things that you are doing to support this student is you are taking the information and you are breaking it down on a calendar for them to complete and you are giving them more time to complete it. But at no point in time, Am I changing the expectation of the assignment? The student is still going to meet the same learning targets or the goal of the same learning targets that the rest of his classmates or peers are meeting. So I would say an accommodation for that. If you had an M and you feel differently, please justify that within the chat. Um, we will go to the next one and I will keep up with the chat as well. So let's look at number two. A test is read aloud to a small group of third grade students. Go ahead and put your A or M in the chat and waterfall. Okay, A is for that one. I think everybody had an A for that one. All right, I would definitely select A, assuming this student was a third grade student and was working on third grade learning targets, right? So we have a small group of third graders, the test is aligned with third grade learning targets and they're just getting it read to them. So again, we are giving an access point. We are not modifying the content. Now, Kristen, good question. If it said that a first grade level test is read aloud to a small group of third grade students, then, we might put the M in there, right? Because it's changing the content or the complexity of the test. All right, so looking at number three, a fifth grade student is working alongside peers in a general education environment. The learning activity is based on content connectors aligned to the fifth grade curriculum. Put your A or M in the chat. All right, waterfall. Sorry for those of you waiting patiently. I forgot to say that. Okay, so we have modification on this one. I did see some A's at the beginning. So typically, for those of you who are unaware, content connectors are connecting to the standard, but they're working at a lower complexity. 
So these content connectors might lead me up to that fifth grade standard, but it's I'm not there yet. I'm working at a lower level. So I'm in the fifth grade classroom working with the peers, great environment in which I should be learning, but I'm learning something that is a lower level complexity that's aligned to fifth grade curriculum, which is wonderful, but it's not fifth grade curriculum. So that would be a modification. So nice job for those of you who put that. All right, number four, a student with a learning disability in math is only required to do 10 of the 20 homework problems in Algebra 1. Put your A or M in and waterfall when you're ready. Oh, Courtney says it could be either. It depends on the problems that are eliminated. Absolutely. Okay, so Courtney, because you're not able to unmute, um, I will go ahead and elaborate on what you were saying. So A or M would be accurate in this case. And let me explain why. Math gets a little bit tricky when we are doing accommodations and modifications because oftentimes we reduce the workload. Reducing the workload is an accommodation if all concepts being taught are still met by that student. So oftentimes think of an algebra worksheet or an algebra page out of the text. What we often find is that the first half might be positive integers. The next half might be negative integers, as an example. If I'm only giving them the top 10, then they're only working on positive integers. That doesn't cover all of the content required of the general education students within that class. So just to be aware, what I need to do to keep that an accommodation and not a modification is I need to give you one to five for the positive integers, and then I need to give you 11 to 15 for the negative integers so that you're exposed to both parts of the content. And then if I do it that way, then it's an accommodation. But if I completely take out an entire section of the, the concept that's supposed to be gained within that Algebra 1 class, then I am lowering the complexity. If I only have to do positive integers, and we know typically it starts out easier and the complexity gets harder throughout the worksheet. So just be aware of that. If you are providing an accommodation to a student um, that you are not um, taking out some of the concepts that they need to master when you are shortening homework assignments. I have a question. It wouldn't go in our modification either way because it's less work than the other students. Okay, so less work is, is fine. So your accommodation, you're allowed to reduce the number of problems. It's not the quantity of the work that matters. What matters is the concepts that are being covered or those learning targets are mastered by the student. So yes, even if you are to take a larger assignment and break it down, um, as long as those learning targets and those concepts are being measured within the assignment just as they are for everyone else, that's an accommodation and that's okay. That is not a modification, good question. All right, the last one. In social studies, an eighth grader studying the Civil War is given third grade level text to learn the content. So what you think, you can throw that in the chat. You have some M's. Okay, all M's on this one. We have one A, okay. All right, so as I'm looking here, and you can justify differently, but what if I tell you that the learning target is the Civil War, not the grade level comprehension of text? Would that potentially change your answer? Okay, so again, go back to the learning target. Now I have, I have done these questions before in different groups of people. And let me just throw this out there to be transparent. I've had some say that, well, if we're given a third grade level text, then they can't possibly go to the complexity of what the eighth grade text would in terms of the Civil War. Okay, I don't, I don't necessarily disagree with that. I'm no social studies teacher. But what I do know is I could use a third grade level text to supplement something that the student could be successful reading when they're gaining information about the Civil War. 
And then if they needed to go deeper into the concepts, I could also provide eighth grade level text with an audio version. And that would be an accommodation, not a modification. Um, so just to paint the picture, there, there might be some, some disagreement there. And you can say, well, if, if the concern is they're not getting the level of content needed around the Civil War because that text is too simplistic, then we have to find another way to get them the content at that eighth grade level, but maybe reading's not reading with their eyes is not how they're gonna get it. And maybe they need to listen with their ears. And that's another way to accommodate. Um, so again, just you have to know the context and be able to justify it either way when we're talking about accommodations and modifications. But nice job. Thank you for participating in that activity. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes left. So the last thing that we're gonna do is just talk about a case study. And I'm gonna let you, um, Look at a case study of a student named Jose, and he's got some goals listed. The first thing that we're going to do when I show you this case study is you let me know which goal you would focus your instructional planning time on. So when you're providing that specially designed instruction, which goal would you try and tackle first? Can't always do them all at once. So which one would you look for? And then I want you to consider the steps that we went over on slide 18. And that's, I know you don't have them memorized by any means, but just kind of think through what some of those probing questions were when you're planning for SDI. And then we'll discuss some potential options um, for SDI. And also beyond that, look at accommodations and modifications um, in our last few minutes together. So first thing, what goal? Second thing is what SDI, and third thing is what accommodations and modifications. So I'll give you just a minute to read about Jose. When you are ready, put a one or two in the chat based on which goal you would focus on first. One being the first one about inferential and evaluative compre comprehension questions. And the second one would be just the main story element. Okay, lots of twos in the chat. Do I have anybody who's willing to say why they selected the two over the one? It's more foundational, absolutely. Recalling the main story elements are often right there answers, right? I can go back to the text and I can find them right there. When I'm talking about inferring, I have to have knowledge, I have to read the text and I have to put my knowledge in the text together to come up with the answer. And that's quite a bit harder when I'm evaluating the text. Again, that's a higher level skill. So definitely focusing on rec recalling main story elements. And as we're looking there, knowing a little bit about Jose, you don't know his ins and outs, but a little bit within this paragraph, what might be some specially designed instruction? Remember what the teacher does, adapting the content, methodology or instruction, delivery of instruction for the student. What might you do for Jose? All right, I think, oh, I get a baseline is vocabulary and background knowledge. Absolutely. We want to know what foundational information he already has because we don't want to waste time reteaching that. 
visuals and organizers, even just modeling. This is, as I'm reading this, this is what I'm thinking about. Do a paragraph together and then allow him to do a paragraph independently and see if he can start gaining some of those skills. Even just definitions of what those main story elements are. Maybe there's a knowledge gap there with the vocabulary, as you were saying earlier. Absolutely. Anything else that we have on this? Yes, I do. We do. You do. When in doubt, that we know that's research based. We know that explicit instruction is there. Check for understanding throughout the lesson. Yeah, uh, helping them self advocate. Maybe the goal is beyond reading and you're embedding one of those self advocacy goals within your instruction. So, helping Jose recognize what's hard for him, what's not so hard for him, and asking for support when needed. Teaching the skill of chunking. How do we teach him to stop and ask himself questions while he's reading? All of that could be specially designed instruction, absolutely. Okay, so thank you all so much for participating via the chat. It made it much more interactive and fun for me. Um, we have a few minutes left today, and I do want you to know there is some guidance on SDI on our website that you can definitely access. Um, as promised, I will give away the Ann Benninghoff book, and I will give away one high leverage practice. What I ask for you on the next slide is my email address. Um, once your name's called, if you'll just email me your um, name and mailing address. So I don't care if it's your school. I don't care if it's your house. It's only going to go to me. But don't message it here. Just email it to me. Um, and I'll make sure that you get those um, as well. The other resource that I like to tell people about, it's a bigger fat one and it's a thick one. But if you are co-teaching, sometimes we see teachers struggling to implement specially designed instruction in that co-taught classroom. Um, and this is a great resource um, to be able to give you some tricks of the trade of how to do that. Um, again, it's, it's a little more textbooky than the other ones, um, but I do like that one as well. All right, Lindsay, can you give me a number between one and 10? Uh, eight. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight. Katie Smith, are you on? All right, Miss Katie Smith, I will put my email up and then you can email that to me. Give me one more number. Between one and 10? Yep. Two. Oh, two, okay. Let's see, the next one is Kristen, is it Winsman? Winsman? If you could also email me, then, oh, and I don't have my email in here. Let me put it in the chat. Sorry, I was on the last slide deck. There you go. Email is in the chat. Um, so Kristen and Katie, go ahead and, and I will send you, um, Katie, you won the trifolds because I talked about that first. Kristen, you won the SDI book. And I will let Lindsay take over from here. Thank you so much, Marcy. Um, wonderful presentation. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us today. Participants, before you leave, please remember to go to the chat and click on the link that I put in there uh, to provide feedback on the section, session and the symposium. You can complete the feedback form after each session or at the end of the day. This form is required to receive your PGP points for participating today. Thank you so much for joining us and enjoy the rest of Breaking Down Barriers Fall Symposium. Have a good one, everybody. Thank you.